He writes about the Romans in Scotland having lost 50,000 men. 50,000 men's a lot of men. How would lose. they be losing 50,000 men? Ambush. What's your take on stone circles? They are sites, obviously, for uh, some kind of ritual behaviour, and some of it would probably have involved a lot of public sexual intercourse. It was done after Culloden. It was ethnic cleansing, deliberately ordered by the Duke of Cumberland. There is no doubt about this whatsoever. This is why the Highland tribal system was so loathed by governments in Edinburgh and Westminster because you could get an army on the march in a matter of hours. Stuart McHardy, welcome to the Journey Home podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Could you give us a little bit of your background and tell us how you got into Scottish history and writing and where you grew up? Right. Well, I started out in Dundee. Um, no lived there for a very long time. Uh, and I went to university here to study history because my family, not just my parents, but uh, my wife too, um, I've always brought up the fact that whenever we're out and about in Scotland, I seem to be directing everybody towards standing stones, stone circles, brochs or whatever. Ever since I was about, I would think about seven or eight, I've been fascinated about who we are and where we're comfy. Uh, and it's a personal thing. And I think that there's nothing wrong with that. I believe quite sincerely that the idea of objectivity in history is a nonsense. You cannot be objective about the past. And I went off to university. Initially, I was going to do English, but when they told me they wouldn't let me study Burns at Edinburgh University, I thought, oh, really? So I um, ended up doing history. And basically, I came away from university. I was going to be a librarian, didn't like it. Ended up working in London for a few years in advertising and recruitment and all that kind of stuff. Then I came back. I was missing Scotland too much. And... Plus, my, my attempts to make a living as, a, as a, a songwriter hadn't gone quite as well as I'd hoped. So I came back up to Scotland and was working as a musician for quite a long time and just kind of drifted into writing and then into radio. And on the back of that, I suppose, things just got more and more interesting. I was doing more and more. Uh, and I ended up setting up the Pick the Shards Society with a friend and from there, I was asked to teach at university. And basically, it's all just unfolded. There was never a career in this. I was always just, I was always just following my nose, I suppose. It's good, that, though, that you enjoy your career. It's something you have a real interest in. Well, I wouldn't say it's a career, to tell you the truth. The, the, the one thing I can say is that I'm a fair age now and... I've probably had what you would call a straight job uh, for about five or six years in my life because uh, I don't really like the idea of working for other people. So the, and the, the whole thing about history and archaeology and now geomythography, which I teach, is that it's all, it's all kind of followed on one thing to another. It's not been, it's not been planned. It's just following my interest, trying to find out what I think is interesting. And then, of course, you know, writing and broadcasting and, you know, teaching all comes out of that. But it wasn't what I'd, I... I didn't sit down with a, a plan at all. Do you remember the very first time that there was one thing in Scottish history that just intrigued you? I think what I do remember is at primary school, we were taking it for a, a day trip to the top of Kinpurney Hill in the in the Seedleys behind Dundee. Not the Sidlaws, the Seedleys. I've looked into this and that's what the, the name was Where written. Where does that as. name come from? Well, I I think it means the the fields of the fairies, the Seedleys. Okay. I would think it's Sidlaws is the, the standard interpretation, which is the hills, the fairy hills, supposedly. But we're taken up there and there's a a kind of folly. Uh, late 18th century, I think, uh, on the top of it. But when we came back and we were asked to write an essay, I started writing about people that used to live there uh, effectively in prehistory. It was the first thing I ever wrote. My first essay I can remember doing at school. I remember the teacher being fascinated by it. And in later years, what really got me was that that hill actually had what they call a hill fort on the top of it. A Pictish hill fort? We'll have to talk about the designation of Pictish and what that 
from my point of view, I would probably say that's acceptable. Uh, but of course, most of the hill forts now know are nothing to do with defence or, or militarism. At okay, all. because you know? just on Monday, last Monday, I was on the top of the Brown Catter thing. Oh, right. And I've always assumed that that's a Pictish hill fort for defence. I mean, mm -hmm. and when I was standing there, I thought, oh, this has got a great view. You can mm -hmm. see anybody coming. But, but why would you choose to live there otherwise? You wouldn't live there. Right. This is a thing that the it's now being kind of accepted that the use of these hilltop sites is not limited to defence. To me, it's not about defence at all. And an awful lot of it is about the white caterton on the next hilltop from where you are. And that I have been looking into for years and years and years. And I mind going up there, God, 60 years ago, we'd be getting on for now, from my father who was an engineer. And we walked around it and he did a kind of, you know, he was a mechanical engineer, but he was, you know, very, very astute character. And he did a rough calculation of how long it would have taken to build. And the idea that that could have been built as a defensive structure would have taken so many years. And it would take, if it had to be built as a defensive structure, these things are normally built because they're needed. Something's happening. There is something going on. Uh, and the idea that it could have been built in response to some so situation. Kind of conflict or... Yeah, a conflict. Or it's nonsense because the number of people that lived in the area in that time, it took, probably took them decades to build that. Aye. It's not something you could throw together quickly no. when no. you're in trouble. No, and if you walk around it to defend it, it would have, you know, you need a man every, I think it's every two yards, two metres or something. Um, was the old rule of thumb uh, along a rampart. There wouldn't have been enough warriors to man it as a defensive structure. It's not defensive. Very, very few of the hilltop structures are. Some of the some of the ones in the west, which are much smaller, the dunes certainly could be. But most of these hilltop sites are actually, I believe, were ritual, ritual sites. Yeah, and the the idea of set of building up the wall uh, is to separate. It. It, it's like. To say it's a holy space might be going too far because we didn't really know what their religion was. But the the term that they use in folklore, a liminal area because it's been separated out and you're going there and the, the whole community is going there. And I mean, people are still lighting fires on hilltops into the 19th century because these were gathering points for the communities. Something that struck me when I was up on the Brown Catterthon after reading your book, The Nine Maidens. I couldn't get it out of my head when we arrived there that there was nine entrances to the Brown Catter thing. Yeah. I thought, is that just a coincidence after reading Stuart's book, yeah. The Nine Maidens? No. Because I didn't read that in the book. But yeah. That... Yeah. Well, the, the book doesn't talk much, talks a wee bit about the, the kind of rit ritual and magical use of nine. But if you go through, for instance, all of the early Irish texts, um, it's always nine guys or nine this doing that, and things are done nine times, or there's nine birds. Nine crops up all the time in the early Irish stuff. We don't have uh, surviving literature from that period, so we can't be sure here. But what we do know from the folklore is that an awful lot of ritual activity is done, not three times, but nine. Nine seems to have been an absolutely fundamental part of how people acted in the world. Have you any idea what kind of ritual they might carry out? Yes. Um, and some of it would probably have involved a lot of public sexual intercourse. Right. I think that was part of it. But one of the keys to understand it for me was they talk about a lot Beltane. You know, we've even had, we've even had the revival on Carlton Hill, um, which can get quite spicy itself at times. Uh, but I was reading about talking, probably lecturing about uh, Beltane and the fires at Beltane and why the fires were so important because you, you, all fires were put out. There was the raising of new fire uh, by friction and everybody took a bit of that at the end of the ceremony and took it back home and relit their own fire. Fire was central to how people performed at Beltane. But then I came across... Oh, sorry, can I just go back? Yeah. What, what, could you just explain Beltane there? Beltane, it's the 1st of May. The 1st of May, The 1st okay. of May. Um, and it's not... This isn't unique to Scotland or even to the British Isles. 
it, it's a very important time across the world. And what happened was I was talking about the, the actual fires and somebody had found out what the component woods were. And I noticed that one of them was juniper. And it made me remember that there's an old Gaelic phrase that basically says to be caught between the fires of Beltane. So there were fires, not just one. And putting two and two together, I realised something. That juniper, the smoke of juniper, is an antiseptic. It was still being used as late as the uh, Crimean War. Yeah, it was, you know, in the hospitals at the time. And if you drove your cattle between two fires that have got a lot of juniper smoke in it, what would that do? Yeah. Kill off the ticks. Okay, right. Because the, at Beltane is when you take the animals who have been kept indoors over the kind of winter period, this is the time you move the cattle. In the highlands, you move the cattle up to the, the high meadows, you know, where there's good grass. Or in the lowlands, uh, we've got the same sizes of communities, they take them out to what they call the forest, which is just uncultivated land, that's all it mm -hmm. means. Uh, you take the cattle away, but this is the time that they've come out after being kept in over the, the winter. So this seems to be a process of, how can we say, practically uh, helping the, you know, the keeping of cattle. So the people doing this, they, these are like uh, Iron Age, are we t talking Pictishira here? We're talking, I would say, probably as far back as we can think. Okay, and they're farming animals, grazing them. And they're grazing animals. Animals are, we know that animals are at the core of the tribal systems of the people here when the Romans arrive. Uh, it's still basically the same in physically most of the country uh, into the 18th century because the tribal structure of Scottish society had not basically changed in that time. Is the, uh, how, do we know this from from Roman writings, or, or is it recorded by the by the people of that time? Well, we have nothing here. Okay, uh, we have no due to a series of invasions by various people from south, uh, who we don't necessarily have to mention, um, and the Romans themselves. If there was anything here written about early Scotland, it's long gone. But we do know what the Romans tell us, and the Romans tell us quite a lot. And there are tribal warrior people. Uh, and that's what a considerable number of them still are in the middle of the 18th century. And the Romans, what, how far into the area did they come? Well, the oh. Romans get up as far as Murrayshire. They keep coming back. They keep coming back. And the reason they keep coming back is that they keep getting hammered, basically. They come up. Uh, they came, they saw, they left again. It's basically the Scottish version of Julius Caesar's famous dictum. But... For like for instance, for they're here for twenty years, near enough on the Antonine Wall. That's the only extended period of occupation we can be sure of. And if you look at the various maps of the Roman forts and signal stations and camps, and and the Antonine Wall itself, what you actually see is a series of campaigns. They are not resident here as such. And the analogy I use for students is think about the the Britons and the Americans in Afghanistan. The only time you're ever out of your enclosure is when you're tooled up and ready for battle. And I think that was exactly the same for the Romans over here. Did they remain, do you think, in, in trade for some time? Or I mean would they have trade traded meat, metals, tools, weapons? Well the, I think the what a couple of things that, that are mentioned in the records is Caledonian bears, you know, for their, you know, their love of, you know, fighting in the Colosseum and all the rest of it, people yeah. fighting each other or animals. Wait, so, so they the, took Caledonian bears The Romans bears for took that. bears oh, yeah. to, to fight yeah. for entertainment. Yeah. Uh, and they also took hunting dogs from here. We know that. They probably were into uh, precious metals where they could find it and if they were left in peace long enough. They were probably here trading for a good while beforehand. And personally, I like the story that uh, Pontius Pilate's mother came through Dull in Persia. I, I think I've heard. You know, <laughs> I, I, I like that because that, that actually is very illustrative of history because stories survive. Stories can survive for tens of millennia uh, despite what they teach at the universities. We have absolute proof of this. And this 
people hang on to stories that tell you an awful lot more than history can at times. And the idea that there was a Roman trader up in Perthshire uh, at the time of Christ makes absolute sense. Because apart from anything else, they, they were sending people out to scout out where they wanted to come and, you know, and take over next. Well, there's a famous tree there, isn't there, in... Um, Fortingal Youth. Fortingal, yeah, where yeah. they say Pontius Pilate played as a youth. Yeah, I love that. It's you know, a great, it's, it's a, a great, great story, story. and but, um, uh, I think it brings a lot of tourism in as well. But it's quite possible, isn't it? Because it's, it's not just possible; it's illustrative of the fact that, despite what has been done to Scottish history, and despite the way uh, our history has effectively been traduced, it shows the fact that Scotland was never beyond the known world. It's just that the whole understanding of history has been skewed by the the central importance of literature. And because of the role of literature in modern Western education, the role of the spoken word has been effectively ignored um, or suppressed. But people keep telling stories. I mean, I've found stories in the past few years that I am pretty sure are thousands of years old in Scotland. Where do you find them? On people's tongues. Okay. People still telling them. Well, I want to ask you, actually, because I, I want to go back thousands of years before the Romans and uh, depict the mysterious Picts. Oh. And the last time I had an episode on the podcast where I, I talked to some people that found a skeleton that they dated back to the Pictish period, I asked them, where did the Picts come from? And they said they don't know. No idea. It's fascinating. Where? What's your take on it? The Picts, the way they were taught, uh, and I remember this from the address myself, you can't use the word Pictish before 296 because that's the first time a Roman wrote it down. Sorry, I want to bow your head as far as I'm concerned with that. Uh, there's a whole whole load of things wrong with that, that we only come into existence because of their say-so. That's a typical imperialist thinking. But in actual fact, the first mention of the Picts is much earlier. It's uh, in a document that was basically just describing the forts on the Antonine Wall, which disappears by 167. And in the middle of the list of forts, there's a name Pexa, which a whole bunch of Roman scholars reckon is a tribal name. And when they do get written about later in 296, it's Picti once, Pecti twice. And the name that survives through folklore is Pecht, or Pech. And I think the term was Pecht, or something close to it. And I think what the people of Scotland thought the Picts were, and this is till relatively recently, were the ancestor people. The idea of trying to fit them into a, a rigid time framework that historians love to do, uh, and also historians like to say, well, yes, they, they had kings and, you know, hmm. and serfs and all that. You know, utter nonsense. They were a tribal people, and tribes don't have kings. But the I think the people of Scotland understood the term picked to basically mean the ancestor people. And that'll do for me. So I think they're the indigenous people and they're here when the Romans come and the Romans mention them. And that's just basically the first writing we've got about them. It's not when they came into existence. No, I mean, and also we have all these uh, stones that they've carved and dotted about the place. Let's just have a look at what you're pointing at there. This is a, is this a Pictish drawing? That is... Painting. Uh, and a frottage, a rubbing. Okay. Uh, of St. Martin's Stain, just north of Dundee. Oh, yes. Uh, by the great, unfortunately late, American artist Mariana Lyons. And the symbol stones are, they're not as opaque as people think. Okay, how do you decipher them? I brought out a book, 2012, I think, um, called The Pagan Symbols of the Picts. And basically what I was doing then was showing that a lot of the symbolism that's used on the Class 1 stones, which, as far as I'm concerned, are the only Pictish stones. The ones with Christian symbolism and Pictish symbolism together are clearly not Pictish. They are Picto-Christian. Yeah. So it's the early stones that interest me. And an awful lot of the animals uh, that are depicted on them are associated both here and in other cultures with goddess-type beings or creatures. Uh, and that is pretty much, I, I think that they are reflective of 
the belief patterns that were in existence before the Romans came. I don't like talking about religion because we don't know enough about it. But uh, I've been doing a lot of work on the basically the goddess figures of pre-Christian Scotland. And the amount of material is absolutely amazing. And the symbol stones do fit in to quite a large extent with what I'm finding out. How far back do you think these stones date? I think that they've not the dating back, but they're still talking about third or fourth century. But it was discovered uh, just, I think it was last year, the year before, uh, then done a Hregig in Kilmartin. They found on the capstone or one of the um, burial cairns there, on the underside of it, uh, a whole series of carvings of deer, which are thousands of years old. So the carving of stone, the carving of animal likenesses on stone dates back thousands of years. And I think that, that some of the Pictish ones might actually be a lot older than has generally been how many thousands that. are we talking? Here? Uh, we're talking probably certainly as far back as 1500 to 2000 BC, possibly much older, because these also, in some way, which were me and my friend Dougie Scott, uh, who I wrote the book Stone of Anse Stones of the Ancestors with, we are looking at the relationship between the carving of symbols and rock art in a wider sense, uh, like cup and ring and the incredible variety in cup and ring. And we're beginning to discern potential patterns in how these things relate. Cup you know, and I'm ring, saying? is that like a, a, a hole? Yeah. It carved into the stone yeah. with a kind of a hollow around it? Yeah. yeah. Used for what? We think the creation of them was in itself a, a symbolic act. We don't know enough about what people were thinking to go much before that. It wasn't for like milling purposes of any no. kind? Or... Oh, no, 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 no. It's something to do with how people understand the world. And again, Dougie and I talk about this a lot, and we think it's tied in with the notion of the ancestors because one of the things about tribal societies in general is that the ancestors are still with you. They've gone, but they haven't. You see what I mean? Mm. Um, and it's something about the creation of these stones, which take you know, these rings, if you're just doing that with another bit of stone, that's taken a long time. Is that how and they would have what, carved yeah. it? With oh, stone I, on stone? Yeah, initially, certainly, because some of them are very, very old. And it's all tied together um, in ways that we're just beginning, I think, to understand. What's your take on stone circles then in that case, the way that they arranged these stones into circular shapes? The... They are sites, obviously, for uh, some kind of ritual behaviour. Uh, the majority of them uh, have some kind of burial in them, which I think is just a process of sanctification to some extent. Um, but they are almost universally aligned on either the sun or the moon or both. They are something to do with the understanding of the world and the seasons. And some of them are also go beyond that. The... Some of them frame what appear to be uh, important sites in the landscape. Um, they are they go back a long way. There are varieties in what they do. It's like the the the, the different range of stone circles and hinges that you get all seem to be kind of localized variants of the same idea, and they are to do with the sun, and the moon certainly, but again. Uh, I would I would say that they are tied in with the notion of the ancestors, but the idea of the ancestors is not what we think of. It's a different concept. The ancestors are not only just part of the world. They are the people that gave you everything in the world that you need to live. These are the ones that chose the land that you live on. These are the ones that, because remember, there's no writing. So everything you need to know to survive in a quite often hostile environment has to be handed down to you which you got from the ancestors, but it's then your job to pass that on. And that awareness of where you are in time as well as in space is something that's difficult for us to comprehend in the modern world. But I'm pretty certain that's core to how people function. How much of the language from our ancestors remains in modern languages now? Like, I'm, I mean, there's a tough question, but like we're going into like Gaelic, English, or not, uh, you know, yeah. the languages, languages we use now, how much of that or can we find any words from the past 
Oh, I there. think we can find a lot more than words. We can find ideas. We find stories. Because one of the things about stories is that stories will jump language change. And one of the things that I think it's quite natural that has happened in Scotland over the past century and a half has been this focus on Gaelic. And one of the unfortunate side effects of that, apart from, you know, the, the equally bad treatment of Scots, uh, is actually the fact that people forget that for a very, very long time, most of the people here actually spoke North Brythonic, i.e. P-Celtic. I've never even heard that word you or that description, North right. Brythonic. Well, that's, in the modern world, the Brythonic languages survive in Welsh, Breton, and Cornish. Uh, that's P-Celtic. Uh, Q-Celtic survives as Irish, Gaelic, and Manx. And they're two branches of the same initial language. But it's very important, I think, to understand that the designations of these languages is only 300 years old. People that were speaking this two, 300 years ago said, oh, you're, oh, you're a Catholic chap. It had no meaning at all. Um, and that's one of the problems that language throws up. Once you designate a language as this, it becomes that description. Whereas the people who spoke earlier than that never knew anything about this at all. But the... There are still place names that have survived uh, from the Celtic area. Uh, there were scholars who suggested that the P Celtic language in Lothian could have survived in the 12th century. But because Gaelic late, you know, spreads in, Gaelic takes over, uh, so you've got Gaelic and Scots, uh, the P Celtic side of it has all been ignored. But the Picts would have been P Celtic speakers. And the boundary line was probably... Loch, to the west of Loch Lomond, they're speaking Q-Celtic. To the right and north, they're speaking P-Celtic in the first millennium. Why is it called P and Q-Celtic? The easiest way I can explain it is um, if you th the P sound in the Brythonic side of things uh, is the same as K. And imagine the Welshman. He's Owen, Map Owen, Owen, son of Owen. Uh, his cousin... Up here is Ewan, Mac Ewan. Right. Because you've got... There are other differences, obviously, but the main dif one of the main differences between two languages is that they use P instead of the K sound. Uh, and you see that in uh, Pennycook, just down the road. In okay. The uh, that's Pen or Pialm, which is the same as the Gallic Kialm, meaning head. Okay. You know? And there's lots and lots of, of instances of that kind of thing. What sort of place names would be... Uh, like P Celtic. I mean, what would be like a, uh, how could I find a Pictish place name? Well, they reckon Aber. The most common one is Aber. Like Aberdeen? Yeah. Aberfeldy. Aberdeen, Aberfeldy, you know. Um, Aberlemno. Uh, uh, which is Inver in Gaelic. Right. And it's the same thing. Uh, but nowadays, the specialists in place names are very good at going back and teasing out where a Gaelic name uh, was initially a, a Pictish or Brythonic name. The... Problem is that by the time you're getting the compilation of the maps, the Ordnance Survey maps, in the 19th century, the guys that are going out and doing the collecting only know about Gaelic. They don't know about the earlier stuff, and everything to them is Gaelic anyway, which is quite possibly what it was, but there also there could have been quite a bit of it lost at that point. Uh, we don't know because it's... It's like every other aspect of Scottish culture. The, the, the resources that are devoted to the study of our history and our culture are minuscule. You know, one of the problems of being in a, how should we say, an unbalanced relationship with a larger nation. I, when I did the, the podcast with the, the archaeologist that dug up the Rosemarkey Man, mm. they did say to me, like, the biggest hurdle they have is, like, actually finding the financing to excavate these sites now they have like along there about 20 caves <laughs> that they haven't excavated oh, yeah. and, and, I, and as soon as they found out that the rosemarkey man was there i mean me as an onlooker i want to see what else is there yeah what else is in there yeah. that's dug yeah. up but they don't have the resources that's the problem well in some ways the the situation has improved because i would say the most important um probably european dig of the past uh, 20 years has been the nessa Brodgar. That's now come to an end. Uh, the finances are now. They could dig there for another 50 years. And what was there? What were they looking for? Oh, they, what they found is more at the point. I mean, I remember listening to Nick Card at a lecture saying that he thinks that, I think it's, I can't, 
was it Building 8? I can't remember. The big one that they think was dismantled uh, around, around about the year 3000. At the time, was probably the biggest stone building on the planet. Sorry, 3000? BC. BC? Yeah. The largest, they think the largest building on the planet, stone yeah. built pl mm -hmm. building. And there's also a theory. Um, what, what did it look like? It was relatively oblong, um, built of stone. And you can get it on the Orkney Art website. Uh, they do a really, really good job, the Orkney Art website, of doing it. And it was replaced by, I think, seven or eight smaller versions of the same thing, uh, which was maybe something to do with tribalism, we don't know. Was it like a dry stone construction? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, very much so. But also what they found there uh, in the ditch surrounding it uh, were cattle bones. Okay. And one of the suggestions has been that there, there was enough cattle, and they reckon they were all killed at the same time for the same feast, uh, or possibly were. Uh, one of the interpretations has been that there was 10,000 people there. What would the climate be like there at that time? Maybe slightly warmer. Okay. But not by much, I mean, not vastly different. But I think it would possibly have been slightly warmer. But you've also got to remember that, you know, we worry about the climate and all the rest of it, but, you know, people live in Iceland. Yeah. You know? when, you, when you live in Scotland... You're waiting for global warming to arrive. Because well, it's freezing we shouldn't have laughed, but it's true. I mean, this, we're in, what, the, the very end of April, and uh -huh. it's been barely above freezing for the past five nights. You know? I'll tell you. I'm, I'm you. quite intrigued by the, like the, the medieval warm period, the period in Scotland where we seem to have, like, thriving ag agriculture. Mm -hmm. there's, there's cattle grazing higher up. And that wasn't too long ago. Which, which baffles me because mm -hmm. I think, well, I, th I thought it was getting warmer, mm -hmm. but it was warmer a thousand years ago. Aye, it, it varies over time. And the, the, the there are arguments. I mean, I know various scientists that, you know, say that the, the, the evidence for global warming is, is very, very thin indeed. Uh, but also, we don't have records going back that far. If you reckon how old humanity is, you know? Well, I mean, touching on what you said there, 5,000 years ago on Orkney. Yeah. And in big numbers. Yeah. And it must be, I mean, that's a harsh environment, quite exposed. Or would it have been exposed then? Would well, they have a lot of trees? They, they or? probably would have had more trees then. <coughs> but again, what, one of the things is that we only have spots of information. Again, because I know it sounds like, you know, I'm, I'm getting out my fiddle, but the, the amount of research into Scotland's past that hasn't been done is quite shocking. Uh, in fact, and I'll give you a perfect example, right, of how not only has it been ignored, it sometimes it has been deliberately suppressed, right? Now, oh, I can't remember how many years ago it was now, certainly over 20 years ago, I came across a document in Edinburgh Castle, okay? It's called the Cantonment Registers of the British Army in Scotland, 1746 to 54, handwritten. And it's a document of the British Army, coming up from before Culloden till the mid-50s. And what it clearly shows is that virtually every glen in Scotland had a wee garrison. Every town and village in Scotland had a wee garrison. We were effectively under British Army occupation for 10 years after Culloden. And I thought, this is amazing. And the curator uh, at the library and museum there, Stuart Allen, gave me a copy of it. Uh, photocopy and I thought oh you're beauty you know and I went around every organisation in Scotland that purportedly has anything to do with Scotland's past asking for help to transcribe this and the answer I got from them all was oh we don't have a budget for that uh, and several well Kent professors said oh I'll, I'll see what I can do to help and did nothing and then a bunch of my students at a course I was teaching on radical history said can we know transcribe it for you and we transcribed it, and uh, we took a few pages each. And then one of the guys, a wizard, uh, Davy Kelly, he put it up online, and there's now a map, an interactive map on the oh. Stennis website, S-T-E-N-N-I-S. -N -N and the students went out and did amazing work and found even more sites than are mentioned in this. And I think the map now has over 600 of these sites. That's fantastic. I'll, in this video, by the way, I'll put a link in the description yeah. to where people can find that yeah. map. Oh, yeah, that'd as be well. great. But that's an example of not only something that was sitting there being ignored, 
But even when you find it, people don't want to talk about it because the Jacobite period is still dangerous because on the blades of the basket-hilted swords they were using in the 1715, most of which were used again in uh, the 45, there is a wee message which says, Prosperity to Scotland and no union. They had that engraved on the blade? On the blade. Okay. Now, that tells you something, particularly in light of when you think that the night before they go into England, Charlie's Council of War, apart from his Irish pals, uh, were all saying the same thing. We don't need to go to England. Just bring your father over and we'll declare him King of Scots. But Charlie wasn't actually interested in Scotland at all. He was after, you know, the big prize. But he, the, want, he wanted the throne of the whole oh, Great Oh, Britain. absolutely. That's what they were about. And yeah. France as well, was it? or just? Well, no. No, I mean, that, that no, they couldn't have... They couldn't have swung that one. Um, but, oh, no, he was after the, the, the whole shebang. But the majority of people in Scotland that were supporting him were about Scotland, not about the Stuarts. And that's why this period is full of information that has been suppressed. And how long a period is that? I would say, from what I've looked at, I mainly only looked at the period up till probably the end of the 1750s. But the, the British government, are still worried about Jacobitism for quite a long while. And Charlie uh, is still trying to get back the thrones uh, up to the Battle of Quiberon Bay. Um, was that 1759? Where was that? Uh, off Brittany. Brittany. It's a big, big naval battle. Uh, and it's in the books as a naval battle, but it was actually... I had no idea. Invasion. I thought after Culloden that was it. Oh, good God, no. no? Okay, oh, fill no, me the, in. The, the Highlands <laughs> were ready to rise again uh, in 1753, and they would have if the if the word had come, but it didn't. It, so was Charlie know. still in, he's in the background, he's, or at the forefront, is he, how's he, how's he commanding an army or well, any he, support not, after he's, Culloden? He's, he's, I mean, his, his whole thrust is, it's England he wants, so he's, he's dealing with the English aristocrats, with the Catholics, and also some others, the Episcopalians, um, in England, the people that want the Stuarts back, he's dealing with them. Uh, and he consistently sees Scotland as no more than a, a strategic opportunity. He's no interested in Scotland. Is it the softer way in? It, no, it, it basically Scotland is seen as either provide a great distraction so you can put French troops in uh, into England uh, or a variation on that. And he speaks to um, Prussians, Russians, Spaniards, French. He's trying to get all these different people because they all want to screw the British. You know? Yeah, how involved were countries in the rest of Europe in what was going on in the Jacobite era? They are all pledging support at one point or another, or most of them. Sending soldiers, though? Or? Well, uh, well, we get, you know, the, the Spaniards that come over in 1719. There's a few of them. The, there was a possibility that the Swedes could have got involved. I uh, can't remember which Charles, one of their kings died. He was looking at it. But what you've got to realise is that the... In this period, the middle of the 18th century, this is the expansion of Western imperialism. Uh, and they're all fighting each other. And anything that either the French or the Spanish, uh, the Dutch have been taken out of it, uh, but the French or the Spanish or the Russians even, the Russians get involved. Uh, they're all looking to see you know, how they can get one up over the expanding British Empire. What was the so, what was the concern of the Russians? Why were they concerned about it? Uh, because like everybody else, the, the, you know, the, the world has become... Did they view the British know, as a threat, do you think? Oh, they... The, the, there's always tension um, between the Russians and the British because partially because the Navy uh, is the main weapon uh, of the British Empire and they used a heck of a lot of tar and wood and all this, and they got most of that from the Baltic. So the, there's, there's tension there, and there's tension with the Swedes. Uh, so the, the, there's an international aspect, apart from the suppression or the, if you like, the nationalist uh, aspect of Jack Buddhism in Scotland, there's also uh, a whole international aspect of this that has been ignored because Scottish history doesn't matter. Did you not know? Well, the winners get to write the history, don't they? That's, that's the problem. Ah, but this is where, this is where, um, I have real fun in my teaching. The winners get to write the histories, but the losers never stop telling their stories. And the stories survive. 
And if you think about it, I mean, I can't mind when I first heard the phrase, the butcher's apron, uh, to describe uh, the Union flag, uh, because people in Scotland remember what was done after Culloden. It was ethnic cleansing, deliberately ordered by the Duke of Cumberland. There is no doubt about this whatsoever. That's never really been forgotten. And I bet you, you know quite a few Jacobite songs. Let me know, because I, I probably do, but yeah. I, oh, yeah. I, I well, wouldn't you know, know if Come they're... back again, you know, Bonnie Charlie's new one, Johnny Cope, all these things. These are still sung because the people, through the living culture, have never forgotten. Whereas the historians have gone on and just tried to tidy up the pictures and all the rest of it. But the reality, I believe, uh, of why people still sing and find the Jacobite songs so powerful and so heartwarming for us is that we've never actually forgot what it was really about. It's just that they didn't teach it. I don't think it's that long ago in history either, you know, like the Jacobite mm. Rebellion. And it's, it doesn't seem too far away. It seems tangible. Like the Pictish history seems... Mm. I, to me, unfathomable because I can't cast my mind back, and it was such a long period. Yeah, but it's uh, the the Jacobite period is quite intense mm -hmm. and yeah. recent. And there's a lot of battles, and um, well, we've been well reminded by the fictional Outlander oh. series as well. Oh yes, well, yes, maybe the less said about that, the better. <laughs> so, no. I mean, it was it was entertaining, but like you, you would. Th you may end up believing that that's what Bonnie Prince Charlie was like. Yeah. His character or, mm, yeah. um, well, and you, the events ha that happened in it were real. You have to say that, it, I mean, I started out, um, and I come, you know, I was raised in a communist family, um, and don't have any religion or anything like that. But I started out thinking of Charlie as, you know, utterly odious creature. Having studied the period in, uh, in quite a bit of depth, I've actually come to admire the laddie in that he was he undoubtedly was brave, he undoubtedly was tough, and he must have had charisma by the bucket load, you know? And also other things about him. One of the things that we should talk about when we talk about the Jacobites is after the Battle of Preston Pans, just on the road for here, after the battle, which he called a halt to once you realised that it was a rout, he sent up to Edinburgh to get every doctor that they could find to come and treat the wounded of both sides at Preston Pants. After Culloden, Cumberland says, go and kill them. Yeah. There is, in a way, the difference between two men that is absolutely stark and also means that my opinion of Charlie, he was a steward, he was a, he was a royal, and he wasn't interested in Scotland. But as an individual, you had a lot of good qualities. No doubt about it. I did also read, I mean, I, I thought, you know, he came across as a bit of a idiot in Outlander and a coward. But mm. I did read that in the Battle of Culloden, and you could maybe confirm mm. this, that he was up there just behind the front line fighting. Uh, it, it, there's no actual evidence of, of, of him using his own sword, but he is quite close to the battle. He is involved. And also one of the things that you have to, give him credit for, is that when he's on the run for months afterwards, he's living rough. He's living like a Highland warrior on a raid, which in itself is 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 one of the aspects of, of, of our past that never gets talked about. But we have this reputation, which keeps on uh, cropping up a bit. Oh, the Scots are out fighting with each other and all the rest of it. No, that's not quite how it worked. Tribal pastoral societies across the world tribal pastoral warrior societies raid each other to steal each other's cattle. And there was an Italian, Carlo Ginsberg, wrote a very interesting book quite a while back. And he actually, in describing it, says, well, there's certain aspects of, uh, of this, he says, that to the modern to the modern eye, I appear almost like sport, because it's small groups of guys going out, nicking other people's cattle, bringing them back, which is good for gives them more over the winter. But it's also, this is what the warrior does. These guys are trained warriors, and I believe every member of the clan, fit male, uh, would have been trained in use of weapons. Uh, they're proving themselves as warriors, and they're if they're really good at their job, they get the cattle back without a fight. If they don't, there's a, there's a fight. But you're usually talking about up to a dozen men on each side, and there are rules. There's rules? Oh, aye. What are the rules? Oh, there's rules. Um, the, it appears, you know, and I, I have read as much as I can about this stuff, 
it appears that basically, and we've got an example of this, uh, for not far from where you are in Fern, um, just to the west of you, uh, where there was a raid there, and the guys had come down from Bamar, got away with the cattle, they were chased by the Fern men, who outnumber them, but when they catch up, the leader or the the, the Bramar men says, uh, I demand uh, Corleone and Henya, I think is the correct pronunciation. Don't quote me on that. Uh, the fair play of the Finn, which meant that he and the leader or the Fern men would fight it out, right. the champion from each side, and whoever won got to keep the cattle. Is that a fight to the death? Well, as far as I can see, uh, having read a lot of these, it could be a fight to first blood, it could be a fight to somebody says chaps, or it could be a fight to the death. Uh, but things like that often go wrong, and this one did, because the the Fern guy is getting the worst of it. His okay. name was his James. His name was called Leaden Henry from the farm he, uh, he owned, and he's getting the worst of it. And a hare springs up in the heather between the two groups. And one of the, the healing guys uh, shouts, um, according to the story, they've brought a witch and fires at the hare. But of course, the guys, not all the guys from Fern spoke Gaelic, so then all they said was he, he shouted something and fired at us. So a general melee uh, occurs, and the guys from Burmah are wiped out because they're outnumbered. Oof. You know? So if it goes wrong, it goes badly wrong. But they're... The idea of the honour of the individual warrior is seems to be absolutely central to it. And they're warriors, not soldiers. That's the whole point of it. I mean, that must have been pretty hard. Just, I know the geography there. To escape with cattle to Bray Mar from Fern, yeah. you're what, going over Jock's Road there? That, which uh, is a, a mountain pass? They went up Glen Leth Lethnut. Glen Lethnut, uh, By the water okay. socks. Yeah. yeah, you can get up towards Jock, part of Jock's Road from there. I think you can get up to. I'd be an awfully long way around. You to cut get across Jock's Road from there. Okay, okay. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't I'm, get on Jock's Road from there. I'm glad you said mm. that because I was looking at a path over to Glen Clover. Oh, there is. Th 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 there are paths over it. to over to Glen yeah. Clover. Probably the easiest one is if you go up the Loch Lee and go over there. That's actually quite quite an easy bit mm -hmm. uh, from the Loch Lee over to Clover. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's nice. And there's, there's interesting stuff in the landscape there too. There really is. And yeah. speaking of that, and uh, uh, Balmain's Cave, uh -huh. yes. which I think is fantastic. Yeah. I've never actually been in it, but I obviously know about it. I found it one day. Know. That's a cracking story, yeah. that. Oh, I, but there was a lot of a lot of guys like Balmain's, didn't he, didn't he flee after Claude and the stayed? And the people looked after them. You know, Cleany, Cleany McPherson had a cave up on Ben Alder um, uh, where they built a kind of, big wooden cage for him uh, on the side of, of a hill. Who was Clooney McPherson Clooney then? McPherson, the leader of the McPherson clan. Okay. And he's, he was there for years. And there's, there's a lot. He, he lived in that environment? Oh, for... yeah. But the, there's the whole period, there's all kinds of things going on. Uh, there's, there's a very famous guy called Sergeant Moore uh, who was leading a band of effectively Catharan. They were, they were following the old tradition uh, of, of raiding other people's cattle from clan times. But now they are living all year round up in the hills. Uh, and there's a whole load of them on Rannoch Moor. There's dozens and dozens of them. And there's, there's stories about these people. And To, to put know. it in perspective for the listener and anyone that's not been to these areas, the environment is brutal there in the winter. That must have been so harsh. Aye, but we have, this is a good one, there are eyewitness accounts of people coming out from buildings in the morning uh, and looking out the snow snow covered landscape and there's boulders and suddenly the boulders move because this was guys that had been sleeping out wrapped in their plaid in the snow and before they lay down to sleep they'd soak their plaid in a burn. Why would they do that? Because wet wool has greater insulating properties. Why? So. This is I why, never knew that. Well, this is one of the reasons why the islanders are so famed as as warriors, because the you just you've heard about the fiery cross. No, the Clan Tara. Okay, that if the word comes that you've got to get the whole Glen out or the whole clan out, um, what they did was they got a cross of alderwood, one side of which had been burnt, the other side which had been dipped in goat's blood, 
and it's handed to a guy at the chief's house and he's told to run to the nearest Clacken or Balia, the nearest township, as fast as he can, holding this up. Everybody that sees it knows what the sign means. You immediately stop what you're doing, run home, grab what arms you've got, because not everybody's got a full set of armaments, get your big plate on, get a bag of oats, a wee bag of salt, and run to the muster point. The guy with the Karantara, the, the fiery cross, as they call it, he gets the first township, hands it to somebody else who runs Pelmel to the next one, and the same thing happens. And within a matter of a couple of hours, you can have the entire fighting force of the clan gathered. They are there. They've got food, a bag of oats, which will last a week. They've got their plaid, which they can use to sleep in all year round. They've got their armaments and they're ready to go. That's a great system. This is why the Highland tribal system was so loathed by governments in Edinburgh and Westminster because you could get an army on the march in a matter of hours. Well, I mean, looking at the history of the massacre in Glencoe, it was a very sneaky a very sneaky uh, massacre and given yeah. what you've said that's probably the only way they could have executed it yeah would you be would I be right in saying oh, that oh yeah absolutely these guys were, were, were absolutely fierce they're also trained to you know to go out and live off the land effectively like they sleep out uh, they're carrying their food you know they'd have a cup or a, maybe a plate toast their, their oats on so they're not just eating raw oats and water all the time but they are all of this is based on the, the practice of intertribal cattle raiding. This is what they're trained to do. But it also makes them this incredible fighting force, incredibly would, mobile. Do, would they practice like various fighting techniques? I think they'd be taught, I mean, in my investigation of it, it seems that laddies were taught stick fighting from about four or five years old. You fight with sticks and then when you get older, um, you get taught how to use weapons. And go out. But like I say, it, it's not a rich society, so not everybody would have uh, a whole load of weapons. Only the kind of better off, the chief and his, uh, and his close relatives and a few others, um, smiths and all the rest, would have a full set of arms. You know? See, while we're on the Jacobite era, is there any characters in the Jacobite era you, you think need more of a mention? Sergeant Moore, okay. Ian Du Cameron. He is, somebody has got to write the book about him. I've been meaning to for a while, uh, but other projects keep on getting in the way. He is absolutely fascinating. But also that brings up the point, there's more information about him to be found. Uh, and it's only in the past couple of years that the Stuart papers have been available because the Stuart papers, uh, which includes all the stuff about what's happening in Scotland uh, in the Jacobite period, uh, there wasn't a copy in Scotland. Right, until recently. So very recently, they've been made available online. There were copies in uh, Melbourne, Chicago, uh, obviously, uh, but nobody had ever put a copy into any of our libraries. I see. I wondered why. Well, what about this Sergeant Moore? What, would, uh, what can you tell Sergeant us Sergeant Moore. Uh, the best story that's told about him is he, he was, uh, the name that he comes under in, in stories is Sergeant. It's actually spelt with a J. Because he was one of these guys that had gone off and fought in the French army. Um, ever since 1603, Scots had been going, you know, and the Scots had been going abroad um, and serving as mercenaries effectively. And he was in the French army um, when Charlie came. And he's either back immediately after or soon after. He comes over, he fights through the campaign. And then when the campaign finishes, he says, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not surrendering. Because um, you've got to remember there was there was 3,000 men who hadn't even fought at Culloden, you know, uh, and there was a whole load of them when they gathered at Ruthven a uh, day or so after Culloden. Uh, they're all waiting to get their instructions and Charlie tells them, just go home. And they're all going, what? Uh, so he heads off into the hills with a bunch of guys and the, eventually, you know, he's caught. Uh, but the best story I know about him is there's this quartermaster is heading up to Fort William and he's coming up through the Mamors with his escort and two horses carrying the money, you know, boxes full of money. Uh, and the mist comes to him and, of course, he panics uh, and doesn't know what's happening when, and stops where he is. 
when the mist comes up, finds himself alone. You know, the soldiers had headed off in the mist and got separated from him. And at the time, most Englishmen that came up to the islands were terrified. This wasn't beautiful. This was scary. That's how they saw it, you know, all these mountains and this wild weather and all the rest of it. So he's on his own and he's pretty terrified. And he, he, all he can do is follow the path he's on. So a while later, he's gone through between these mountains and he sees up ahead of him somebody standing at the side of the, the path. And he gets closer and it's this six foot four inch black haired, black bearded um, Highlander in full Highland dress, which by this point is illegal anyway. Uh, and the fact he's got a musket across his back, uh, a sword at his side, a brace of pistols in his plate, uh, doesn't really register with the poor quartermaster. He's so relieved to see another human being. And says, oh, uh, says, oh I think I said, where are you going? He says, I'm going, I'm going to follow him. Oh, you're going to Angariston, fair enough. Could you take me? Yes, I will. And as they go along, the guy's so relieved, he starts yabbering and yapping and yapping and yapping and yapping. And he says, I'm awful glad I found you. Awful glad I found you. He said, I've heard such horrible stories about the men in these hills. He says, and there's one in particular, this Sergeant Moore that they talk about. Uh, he says, he's absolutely vicious. He said, you know, I mean, he's, he's he cutthroat, evil, evil person. And the guy, I'm mm, mm, walking along beside his horse. And eventually they get the top of this rise and they look down. And uh, the guy says, well, there you go. There's, there's Angaristian. You'll be safe when you get in there. He says, and by the way, when you get in, he says, tell the colonel that uh, Sergeant Moore is not as black as he's painted and he certainly is too much of a man of honour to take advantage of a poor fool like yourself so you can keep your money. Go. Now, I thought this was a story. He could have just executed Oh, that I guy. could have and run off with the, with, with the goal, but it's about who he was. Aye. And the guy is a, is a true historical character, um, and he seems to have had quite a checkered career. But there are a whole range of stories about him, and he and a lot of guys, others, um, his cousin Duncan Cameron uh, was another one. These guys were out for years, you know, living off the land and raiding... They, Obviously, they're not raiding other clans because so many of the clans have been, you know, impoverished by the, the British Army anyway. But they, they start raiding the lowlands and they, you know, it gets, some of it gets into robbery, not just, you know. But also you had an arrangement with a butcher in Perth to supply him with beef, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a period of our history that really needs to be revisited. And thankfully, um, Murray Pittock at Glasgow University he has a book, I think he's writing it at the moment, on the occupation. Uh, I put together a couple of books of stories because the stories tell you things that the history doesn't. And then you go and dig and you find out that, well, you know, there are historical records. Just nobody, nobody talked about them, <laughs> you know? What was the, you mentioned the lowlands and we've been talking about the highlands. What was the, what's the relationship been like between the, the lowlands and the Highlands, especially around about the Jacobite era? There's been an awful lot of propaganda, but the the best description I've ever heard of it was at the founding of the Elphinstone Institute many years ago now, when uh, Sandy Fenton, professor at the School of Scottish Studies, got up and to do this presentation, and it's one of the best things I've ever heard in my life. He said, people talk about the Highland line, and he said, and it exists, you can see it, it's there. It is a geographical and geological fact, he says, but it is not a cultural fact. And he said, what we have is actually not a Highland line, but a Highland sausage. <laughs> okay. Every single a Highland sausage. Cool. How many drams did he have before he got up? Uh, and he said, no, think about it, he says. What you've got, he says, think of Strathmore, and I think it was Strathmore he used, uh, in Strathmore, he says, into the 18th century, the people in the Strath itself are all Scots speakers. The people into the hills are all Gaelic speakers. He says, but if you look at the foot of every glen that comes down, it says Glen Isla, Glen Clover, Glen Prosen, you know, Glen Queich, uh, Glen Esk, he says, look, all of them, there are wee villages at the foot of it, each and, one of, each and every one of them. Uh, and he said, and this is where people come down through uh, if they're bringing down goods, they could be bringing down whiskey, 
They could be doing, bringing down cattle. They could be bringing down leather. They could be bringing down all sorts of stuff. People are coming down. He says, and just imagine, he says, one day the smith's daughter, because there's Raya Smithy in a place like that, looks out the windy and a young lad goes by uh, driving a couple of cattle and she says, oh, he'll do me. And as he said, all of us men, we know that's it. You've had it. Uh, what language do their children speak? Both. 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 Because their mother's a Scots speaker, the father's a Gaelic speaker, the children are brought up bilingual. Right. And in that area, abutting the line, there's lots of people like that. They've got both languages. And you find this across the world. Think of Schleswig-Holstein, Alsace-Lorraine. People speak both languages. Aye. In the modern world, countries draw lines on maps and pretend that those lines are actual. They are in terms of they might have gun turrets and fences and all the rest of it. But culturally, they don't ex exist because the people on either side intermingle, intermarry. They're always at least bilingual. And sometimes they are actually, they are trilingual because a third you, you local language grows up. Yeah, you have to be to get by. To trade. Yeah. Yeah. And to rule a or chase a man or, what you know, all these things. So he said, basically what you've got he says, is a Highland sausage where the, there's an area of bilingualism between these two language groups. And then, of course, he had, I, I can't remember if he said it or if I did, and said, and if you look around the, the highlands, particularly in the east, you can do a series of sausages, you know. You know it's not Lauren sausage here, it's actually <laughs> Link sausage, you know. But it's, you know, and he's absolutely right. The interrelationship between was, these people is constant. There was something you mentioned there that everybody loves, Whiskey, oh, right? Right. right? Now, I love that period, that romantic period where there was illicit stills all over Scotland mm -hmm. where people were making whiskey. Mm -hmm. How long did that go on for? It goes on, um, God, I should know this. I haven't written a book on it. It goes on into the 19th century. Um, and it's I think it's pretty much in the highlands it survives into the 20th century. In the cities, it's gone probably by the end of the, the 18th century. But at one point, Edinburgh had 200. Who, who imposed the ban on whiskey? Oh, the government. The government? Yeah, because the, the government wanted people to drink gin. Can you put a finger on, on a person? Was there somebody... Oh, it, it, it goes on over years. Right. Um, there's a book on it. Okay. Um, called Tales of Whiskey and Smuggling. But I've not actually read it myself for quite a while. But it, it, okay. it's, you know, it's gone through various publishers and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. Oh, I mean, it's it's ubiquitous. And I haven't myself tasted any for about six years. Illicit whiskey yes. or whiskey itself? Illicit whiskey. Illicit whiskey, okay. Oh, why? <laughs> I know people that are making it still. They make, yeah. It's well, not difficult. To make whiskey. Yeah. I've tried homemade whiskey once. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, Blow your heat off. It's rough. Yeah. Well, it will be. Yeah. You know, the stuff I had was amazingly smooth. Was it? Oh, yeah. And it had never been near wood in its life. What did they put? What did they um He store kept it in, in bottles. Yeah. yeah. And when he when I got it, it was in a hip flask. Okay. Uh, and it was colourless because it hadn't been in wood. But it was fine. What sort of percentage percentage do you think this uh, would be? By the taste, I would say that would have been the high thirties. Right. Yeah. You know? okay. Not that I'm an expert. Aye. I, I I did yeah. read somewhere um that uh, Robert Burns worked as a tax collector and he would An exciseman. Yeah. yeah, and did he did he go around looking for illicit stills? Was well, that part of his that job? That was part of his job. Oh yeah, yeah. He 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 definitely did that. But there's also there's a couple of stories about him that um, and one one day he comes across an old woman who's got a still, uh, and she's on her own. Uh, Sorry, and, let me just stop you. An old wifey. Yeah. Was everybody at it? Oh, I everybody in your granny. Oh, oh absolutely. <laughs> um, women women were, were in particular were were very good at the. At the turning, because what you have to do is you get your malt, you soak your malt, then you've got to put it on a dry, flat floor till it sprouts. And you have to turn it so as, you know, it, it sprouts evenly. Uh, and it's then you start the process of making the whiskey. You know, you, you, you then dry it, you know, okay. put it through the kiln. Uh, you malt it and then you, you make your, your small beer and then you distill it. Um, so this old woman, she's at home she just turning the malt? Yeah, oh, yeah, doing it all. And you know? then Burns turns up. 
Well, the, the story is that he came across this woman and, and it was the only support she had. So he, he basically said, you know, oh, no, I see nothing, you know, and walks away. There's a few stories like that, but he, he let people go um, because he was on the side of the common man. And, and you don't know if it's true or not, because that's the kind of thing people would say about Rabbi anyway, because he is, you know, he's just so culturally important for all of he, us. He's you know? so celebrated. Oh, and quite rightly. Where I live in Montrose, there's a area that they've actually marked out where he stopped to water his horse one day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and I think, how loved was this man yeah. that well, he... Well, why not? He was the world's greatest poet. Yeah. I, mean, I, have, I mean, he's the only, as far as I'm aware, he's the only poet to have been translated into every language that has a literature on the planet, yeah. which says all you need to know about him. He, he wrote about people. When you... Th I. I was watching, I'm going to compare something here, mm -hmm. right? I was watching the Champions League final last year and they were playing mm -hmm. a Queen song in the Champions League final. And I thought, oh, look at that, like Freddie Mercury has been dead for 30 years and mm -hmm. they're still playing his songs. Mm -hmm. But Robert Burns, oh, you go back, oh, old Lang Syne, I mean. Oh, never mind old Lang Syne. I mean, um, Parcel of Rogues is one that I do quite a lot. But the, the, the great one is A Man's A Man. I mean, that's an anthem for humanity. This is what he was about. And the fact he was Scottish is fine because everybody comes from some place. There's nothing wrong, you know, there's nothing wrong with that uh, because he gets accused of all kinds of things. You also will find folk that will say about him that uh, you got to remember that he, he, he was basically fundamentally a loyalist, you know, because he wrote his haughty Gaul invasion threat, um, which was a poem he wrote about the problems uh, with the French Revolution. But the final two lines of that are, we'll never forget the people. We'll never forget the people. And using that term at that time meant specifically the organisation, the friends of the people, who were radicals. Another aspect of Scottish history in, in the 1790s this time has been totally ignored. So what was he referring to there? He the was... friends of the people. Okay. Thomas Muir and his pals. And who were there? Who's Thomas well, Muir? Thomas Muir was an, a lawyer who initially came from Hunter's Hill over in the West, and he was the secretary of a convention of the Friends of the People that was held on the 12th and the 13th of December in 1794. Uh, and basically these were people who had come together, influenced by the ideas of Thomas Paine, who'd been involved in the French Revolution and the American Revolution. And it's the idea of, you know, basically democracy. They were wanting a fair share because the country was incredibly corrupt, particularly in the 1790s. Uh, and they were just basically looking for representation in the modern sense. And the convention was held for two days and then they got arrested and there was a series of show trials uh, and Muir and a bunch of others uh, were sent to Australia. Transported. Exiled. Yeah, supposedly for sedition, which wasn't... They were actually tried under false pretenses uh, sentenced uh, under law that had no uh, bearing in Scots law whatsoever. But that didn't matter. Um, and there's a monument to them in the Carlton Cemetery at the foot of Carlton Hill, um, which has been getting a bit more attention recently. But it's been hidden away, that aspect. And there was loads of others at the time. If somebody came yeah. to Edinburgh to visit at the top of Princess Street yeah. and they could find it up there. Yeah, it's the big monolith. It uh, looks a bit like Cleopatra's Needle in London. Huh. Uh, and it's, you know... Who erected that? It was erected by public subscription in 1840. Okay. Not long after they failed to raise enough money to finish the pseudo-acropolis on the top of Carlton Hill, which was a monument designed to be in honour of the empire. Ah. And they couldn't get the money to finish that. But we got the Martyrs Monument. We right. got the money for that from the people. And that says something about the attitudes at the time yeah, then. I'd say something about Scotland. Mm -hmm. But the, the version of what Scotland is and who we are that gets into the books and goes out in the media all too often is one that is basically designed to please the lairds. Yeah. Stuart, what are you working on at the moment? I know you're working on a couple of books. Um, there's two books to be out this year. One of them is called Hiding in Plain Sight, which is basically an investigation of how much material remains in the landscape and in the culture that is actually derived from pre-Christian thinking. 
and it focuses on the Kayach. That's her name in Gaelic. In Scotch, is known as the Carlin. And in the various stories about her, uh, she creates the landscape. Uh, she works the weather. Um, in one particularly nice story from quite late, um, the time in James the sixth, um, maybe slightly earlier, uh, she's a giant figure and she actually lets fart in North Berwick law, so which has become a bit of a burlesque by then. But in earlier times, she creates the mountains, um, she creates the lochs, and she's the hag of winter, but she turns into the glorious golden-headed bride of summer. This is one of the Nine Maidens. No, 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 no. This is older than the Nine Maidens. Okay. This goes back to very, very early human thinking. And the world is understood through the process of the fact that everything has a mother, so so does the world, basically. I'm looking forward to reading this. And there's stuff, there's stories, there are sites, there are mountains named after her, there are dozens of burdens named after her. Uh, oh, there's just so much stuff, it's unbelievable. And an archaeologist actually asked me a few years back, could you actually gather all this stuff together? Because I suspect there's more than we think. And that's coming out. And after that will be the Handbook of Geomythography. Okay, and what's that going to be entailing? Geomythography is a course I teach at the uh, Centre for Open Learning at Edinburgh University. And it has developed over the years and it entails looking at place through time. Because archaeology and history and all of the different disciplines that look at the past tend to look at things stratigraphically in periods. Uh, I started looking at places in a different way, vertically, if you like. So it's what's happening in one place and how that affects the culture in that place over time. And you find that really weird things, places that seem to have been used for rituals potentially thousands of years ago are the places where the conventicles were held. Uh, in the late 16th century when, you know, the, the battles that are going on over religion and the, the illegal uh, church ceremonies are held, held in places that had already been used long, long before because they were part of local culture and people knew about them. Uh, whereas people, historians and all the rest of it, like to think that people forget about who they are and where they come from enough to go and read them to find out about the past. No, things survive. Like I said, I found a story about the Kayak uh, just a few years ago um, on a hill named after her. Uh, and it was told us by local people. It's never been near a book, but it survives. And ideas like that, just yards from where they were telling me, was a couple of Pictish symbol stones. And the church that was there was in all likelihood built on the site of an origi originally established ritual site. So the continuities of culture through time yeah. uh, are studyable and you can find out a lot and that's what the process of geomythography is about. Well, I, I mean, I grew up right next to the church in Rosemarkey. Oh, right. And mm. um, that was probably put right on the top of a Pictish yes. monastery if, or Absolutely. if you would yeah. want to call it a yeah. monastery or whatever kind of worship place. Yeah. And I know that the stone that's in the Grome House Museum mm -hmm. was picked out of the church, yeah, out of the floor. Mm-hmm. Um, by the way, that stone has a cross on it, right? Yeah. Who, who, who put that there? Well, the thing that ha what happens is from 609 onwards, it's official church policy to take over the pagan precincts. The Pope actually says that in a letter. Pope Gregory says it to Bishop Miletus in Britain. Um, this is quoted by Bede, uh, the English historian. Uh, and he says, take over the pagan precincts, remove the idols, but it is all right to put in relics of the saints. Uh, stop the sacrifice of animals, if that was happening. Uh, but it's okay to have a feast for the saint. No irony understood at all. So what happens is you find that all these places that were already established, the new church comes into because people used to go in there. And in a great many cases in Scotland anyway, these were mounds. So wherever you see a church that's on a mound, that's an almost 100% guaranteed marker of it having been already in use when the Christians came. So they come in, they find these places, they find the stones, 
and they adapt the stones. So they start carving their own. And they include the, the symbols which have meaning in local culture along with versions of the story they want to tell. And that's where you get class two Pictish stones. That's fascinating. I can, I mean, right away, I'm thinking of places that I have been. Um, the one that popped into my head was St. Vigeon's, which is <laughs> on a mound in our With growth. a Kelpie inside the mound. It does it? Oh, yeah, there's a Kelpie inside the mound. <laughs> right. There's Kelpie helped the, Is that the, the story minister. that goes? Oh, yeah, the, the Kelpie helped the minister build it. Right. Okay. I mean, the, the, there are layers and layers and layers of stuff once... You start looking at history that because now everywhere I go, when I mm -hmm. see a church on a mound, I'm going to know that there's more to the history of that building, yeah. that that building was something else in the past. And you can check it out because in most cases, you'll find that there's a reference to a pre-Reformation church there. Okay. Because obviously a lot of churches over the years have changed and the, the changeover from one branch of Christianity to the other uh, affects it and all the rest of it. But the process is, it's... It's absolutely, I mean, it's undeniable. And it's there. And you go to some of them, a lot of them are associated with like Bride, St. Bride, St. Bridget, call it what you will, who is half of the dual figure of the goddess. You know, the kayak and Bride are two aspects of the same thing. Who, who was Bride to the Picts? Bride to the early people um, would have been basically the representative spirit of summer growth, fertility, uh, and probably along with the Irish poetry um, and possibly fire as well, she is very strongly associated with the Nine Maidens. Or the Nine Maidens are very strongly associated with her. Bride in Scotland, Bridget in Ireland. And of course you get the nonsense, and we have had for years, that, you know, she came in from Ireland. No, she's indigenous. Because, you know, I presume you know that the Scots didn't come from Ireland. I'm not, I don't know, I don't know where they came from. The this Scots are indigenous, the EU. same as Picts. The Scots are, are as indigenous. Okay. Uh, there's one article about this that's taken its time to filter through uh, by Ewan Campbell, Glasgow University, uh, where the Scots Irish. And he goes and looks at this and none of the evidence to suggest that the Scots are Irish is contemporary. It's all much later. And he suggests, and I agree 100% with him, that what you've got, based in Argyle, the Scots, Dalriada, call it what you will, is a thalassocracy, a sea-based country, polity, kingdom, call it what you will. But so there's Ireland, the north eastern part of Ireland is part of this, and quite a bit of southwestern Scotland is part of this sea-based thing that's between the two countries. And that, to me, makes absolute sense yeah what seems strange to me is that you would have a land like britain mm -hmm. a land of britain and you would cross the sea populate mm -hmm. an island and mm -hmm. then come back across and populate the north of <laughs> the island that you left from well, or if that's the way it went yeah it doesn't seem it, to make sense to me well that. the the links between scotland and ireland go back um probably to the earliest settlers because people are coming up from round about northern spain as the ice retreats people are coming up the coast um, and we don't know how much of the English Channel existed then. Probably not that much. But people are coming up, and if they were coming up to Scotland, they were going into Ireland. And people have been going back and forward. I mean, you can stand in Kintyre and see the hills of Antrim, you know, if the weather's clear. You can sail over on a good day in a couple of hours. These people have been related since, since humans were in this part of the world. They are related. Uh, it's just that the, the notion of the Scots having come from Ireland has somehow crept into so much because well again because it was it was written down and who was it written down by? I don't know. Monks. Who was the monk's great hero? Saint, Saint Columba. Columba. Where did he come from? Ireland. Aye. Spin, as far as I'm concerned. Remind me, he came to Scotland to try and spread Christianity, right? And he was was he executed in the end? Uh, no, 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 no. He he is thrown out of Ireland because of behaviour that would be unacceptable in anybody. First, he effectively stole a book. Okay. Um, it was a religious book that had been copied uh, and he kept it. Whereas the guy who owned the original, another um, abbot, um, Christian abbot, uh, said he wanted it back. Uh, so he took him to court, a uh, religious court, and they, I think the famous judgment was the 
the cow goes, the calf goes with the cow because it was written on leather. Uh, so he's supposed to hand it over. He refused. So there was a battle. Right. Uh, and quite a few, you know, he called out his his clan, the O'Neills, uh, to fight this other guy. And so there's a battle. A whole load of people are killed uh, and he's sent into exile till he's at least converted as many people as were killed in the battle. So he's thrown out of Ireland and then he comes to Scotland. And then, you know, the spinning starts. <clears throat> he arrives in the West Coast. Yeah. And... How long does it take him to kind of spread his word and uh, Christianity? Like, nobody did they, knows. Did, but nobody did they, knows. They come nobody to the knows. East Coast, or does he? Is, does he? Is it prolonged in the West Coast? Uh, you've already had a guy called Ninian, a uh, hundred years and a bit earlier, who'd been down in Galloway, and he'd converted uh, quite a lot of people. But then they're supposed to have slipped back. Supposed to have. We don't know. Uh, and then Columba comes over. And then slowly but surely Christianity spreads out from Dalriada. But the thing is, we don't know very much about it because we've only got the word of other priests to go by. And would you trust the priest after what we found in the past 30 <laughs> no, years? No. You know? uh, so everything that's written by the early monks has to be treated as propaganda. Um, and Columba becomes this gigantic figure 100 years after he's dead. Incidentally, at the same time, as the Church of Rome is taking over the localised British churches. And it's from there on that Columba becomes this great creature, um, you know, miracle worker and all the rest of it. Um, it's, you know, it's one of these things that, you know, people believe what they want to believe a lot of the time. The people at that time then somehow have worked their way into the Pictish life and just assimilated their culture then, have they? Well, the, for, in in some way, I, I don't know how it happens because we don't have any records, but somehow the allegiance of the church changes. The local churches, the Columban churches, as they're sometimes called, the British churches, they were all independent, or there might have been two or three in a group, but the head of them was an abbot, which is what Columba was. Bishops were guys who basically ordained other priests. But then after the Synod of Whitby in 664, the rules of the Catholic Church come in and then it becomes very structured, very hierarchic, um, very centralised and as Mary Beard, uh, the Roman historian, said, well, as far as I'm concerned, uh, Christianity uh, can be seen in many ways as the Roman Empire Mark II because they come in and use the same administrative areas uh, and it becomes that very structured thing. And the indigenous church, which Columba was initially part of, which was local and, I suspect, very much tied to the local clan, uh, that goes. Okay. But we don't, again, we don't know. We've only got their word for it. I, you know, I really wish that um, way back then there was podcasts. Oh, well, so yeah. the spoken history, well, you know. I, but one of the things that we can find out more once you begin to realise that the oral tradition holds on to certain things, you've got to be awfully critical. But stories that survive about place in particular can tell you a lot because they've survived because it's local people telling them. And it's all about understanding that society is based locally and so is culture, whereas history writing in books are based around institutions like universities which are part of cities which are part of centralized structure and culture the living culture of a people is not actually what's being reflected in these things and there is still lots to find out and once you begin to become critical of what i refer to a lot as a received opinion and once you become critical of it all kinds of possibilities grow up i'm very critical of it uh, mm. i've got to be honest because you you're looking at text now, history, written history, that mm. was written by somebody. We don't know how well they researched their topic and we don't know if they had an agenda at the time. Did they have any preconceived ideas? Well, the thing is, you can always figure out what the preconceived idea is. If they're, if they're a Christian, which all of our early historians were, their first loyalty is to their God or to what they think is the word of their God. It is not to anything we would recognise as truth. In terms of the Romans, they never wrote history at all. They, they, it was all propaganda. 
effectively with the Romans. But because of that, you can take stuff out of the Romans that you can be pretty sure is accurate because there's no reason to tell you this as as what we would think objectivity because they're not. Am I right yeah. in saying a lot of what the Romans left were just kind of like accounts, records of exchanges of money and but gold? There's, there, trade there's a lot and... of that, but we 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 are very very lucky. We 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 do have bits and pieces of people like uh, Dio Cassius or Dio Cassio gets uh, differently spelled. He was the secretary to Septimus Severus, who was actually here in the early third century. And he writes stuff. He, he tells you some amazing things that they just ignore. One of the things he wrote, and this is in the year 217, he writes about the Romans in Scotland um, because they'd conquered England, you know, a bit earlier than that, having lost 50,000 men. I take it he's not referring just to the seven years that Severus is here. But even if that's from coming in in the year 80 to 217, 50,000 men's a lot of men. How would they be losing 50,000 men? Ambush. Ambush. Yeah. They're venturing beyond the Antonine Wall and getting ambushed. Yeah, well, he's saying 50,000. I mean, why would he exaggerate that? Yeah, well, there's no you reason know, to. You know, that doesn't, doesn't sound good to, for you know. uh, propaganda. No, no, it doesn't. And he actually describes um, the natives in bogs up to their neck. What? Yeah. They're, in, they're standing for hours in bogs up to their necks. Ambushed, they're waiting. They would just lie in mud. Yeah. Up to their neck. Yeah. And then the Romans are coming out foraging or getting wood or whatever. Um, and any small patrol is, you know, because to me, a lot of this is about Mons Gropius, which, you know, it's supposedly this great battle that was fought. Uh, it's never been found. I mean, you've been looking in the wrong place. But the if that did take place, and if the Roman figures are to believe, which they're not, 30,000 Caledonians killed, 364 Romans. Um, reminds me of the American Vietnam War, you know, uh, kind of thing. But if they did fight them in a pitch battle, they'd only do it once because the Caledonians, stroke picked, uh, are warriors trained to fight mano a mano. That's basically how they do it. Whereas the Romans have got this killing machine, you know, like the tortoise that just comes in and soups up everything in front of it uh, you would only fight them in a pitch battle once because you're not going to win Is there any truth that, in it that the uh, Picts would fight naked? Quite possibly quite possibly there's Kalesi man uh, the carving on the Kalesi man stone he's just wearing a cloak and has a spear and a shield uh, as described by Dio Cassia um, but also the, the whole term berserk which people think is Norwegian may actually be Scottish, Bearsark, because this is what they were doing in Highland warf well, battle. Uh, you throw off your plaid. You get above your enemy if you can. You throw above, throw off your plaid, you shout and yell and scream, and then you run down the hill with targe on that arm, dirk in that hand, sword in, whoops, sorry, sword in the other hand, uh, and you're just wearing your shirt. So the psychological effect of half-naked men charging at you if you're not used to it, must have been quite considerable. It would have been. You know, that's the Highland charge. Did they, do you think it was because they saw armour as cumbersome in some way? Or? I think it, it, it's <coughs> that if they were thrown off their, their plates, the plate's too cumbersome and that's nothing compared with armour. You know, armour is, is not conducive to, you know, what you might call athletic movement, is it? One of the uh, archaeologists that were, was working on the Rosemarkey man, he was mm -hmm. telling me that he's been, he'd been doing some digging at Culloden as well and they All were... Right. They'd um, pulled up some lead shot and um, he started telling me about this story of how the uh, the Jacobite soldiers had just thrown their pistols away. He said um, his take on it, based on how far the lead shot had gone, they know which was uh, the Jacobite's lead shot. Mm -hmm. he, 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 they, they thought, actually, they were too close to reload. So they just threw them and just charged. That's part of the, the process. The process is, ideally, you get above. The Highland Charge, you, if you're lucky enough to have a musket or a pistol or a brace of pistols, as you charge, you shoot. Then you throw down your weapon. And while you're running, and this could be down the side of a hill, these guys were, you know, some athletes, you take your targe from off your back, you slip your targe onto your arm, you take your dirk out, you put it in your left hand, then you pull out your sword. 
while running. And then you hit the front line and it's like that with your targe, which has got a spike in it, which takes somebody out that way, moves him to the, to the side, uh, and then you slash in that way. And they, they were terrified of the Highland Charge. That sounds like a pretty well-practised method that they, you would yeah. probably practise that and simple yeah. and na really very nasty. It's one of the reasons Culloden is such a bore. Uh, that you know it's flat. Yeah. It was it was entirely the wrong place at the wrong ground, time. And, oh, it was it, it was it was just. I mean, it was stupid beyond belief. You know, to fight there and then. If they'd fought two days earlier, uh, the result could well have been different. They should not have fought that day. They should have dispersed. From what I've read of the the history of it, written history, but it sounds like a total disaster. Oh, it was it, it, it was all round. Yeah, and it was the only battle they ever lost. I can't imagine the effect on local communities when all those men were lost suddenly. Not just a couple of, you know, no. hundreds of men. Oh, hundreds of men. And But then again, there were still thousands of them that hadn't, hadn't got to the battle. Mm -hmm. You know, it could have carried on. There was no... Um, Charlie chucked in the towel, effectively. Um, but that was because he wasn't, he wasn't interested in Scotland. He was interested in, you know, the British Empire and the throne of England more than anything, um, which is a shame. But also one of the things that's amazing about it is there was £30,000 on his head in 1746. That's a, that seems a sum. Yeah. That's a, a real... And nobody, nobody dobbed him in. Well, that shows the what they what they felt, and they were obviously honourable towards him. And even, even if you had been unsympathetic towards the cause, which I'm not sure many were, um, other than a select few... After what happens, where they're actually killing the wounded on the battlefield, what did that spread pretty quick? And so the whole country turned against Cumberland. Right. You know? Well, that's interesting because it's not information I've heard. I mean, I just thought that, that after Culloden, communities were so crushed that they just couldn't... Oh, no, it was deliberate. deliberate. There's all kinds of murder going on. They're using um, the Isle of Egg, according to some of the reports we've got, and... A lot of this wasn't published till the late 19th century. The information was gathered, gathered uh, about 10 years after Culloden. But uh, according to this fabulous book called The Lion in Mourning, uh, I think it was every woman on Egg was raped. They were using rape as, as a weapon of war. And that was the Navy going out into the islands. Uh, and they were killing people willy-nilly. Uh, they were taking all their stock uh, to such an extent uh, Cumberland organised... Uh, dealers to come up from the lowlands and from England to buy all the cattle and horses that the, the troops were bringing in and they had to put out an ordinance and one of the slight bits of history it tells you so much to say that no private soldier could ride a horse because they'd stolen so many horses even just ordinary privates had horses at Fort William God, that's harrowing no oh, I they mean well it, it was ethnic cleansing ethnic cleansing yeah I mean there's no other word for it I mean I spoke to you before we started the mm. podcast about the Highland clearances mm. and uh, and to me that as far as I knew was ethnic cleansing not not in a way that they're 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 killing people but yeah. they're just clearing them yeah, yeah. Um, I mean this, this lays the ground for that because the Gaeltacht as a whole was a danger uh it's not just that I mean that, that some of the propaganda of the time is absolutely disgusting but it is on one level you can understand why centralised government behave like this because these guys, and by this point I don't think there's many female warriors in the islands, but these guys could march within hours and they could go for days. They could outrun horses. You know, the horse would get ahead of them. Mm -hmm. but, but by the time the horse tires, these guys duration. would just come up and go. These were incredibly fit, highly trained and also phenomenally mobile troops. And they were a danger because you could get them, you know, you could get them going in, in weeks. I could, not in dates, hours actually, you know. You could just well imagine the environment that they lived in, how fit they would be. You'd have yeah. to be. You'd, there'd yeah. be no choice to be. You uh, wouldn't be unfit. No, you can't be. If you're going up and down hills all day, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's better than going to the gym. Oh, definitely. You know? I would go up and down hills all day if I could, uh, given the choice. Um, how did that compare? Like, I, I, you said that there was a price, and that was a sizable price oh, on God, yeah. Charlie's head. Go way back to another uprising, like mm. William Wallace. Did he have a price on his head that people defended him from? 
the, the he, locals. He, he was being sought by, I, to tell you the truth, I don't know. That's something I'd have, actually have to look at, but um, quite probably. And of course, he, he, you know, this is is very interesting because he, he gets tried for treason under the laws of a country he's not from. Wait, he, he did say that in the trial, didn't he? Oh, yeah. You have what? no right to try me for this. Yeah. You know? And what is very interesting, and it's one of these things that, again, snippets after 1707 and the Union of Parliaments or the, the One Chancy Covenant, as friends of mine refer to it, the following year, Westminster passed the Treason Act, which is known as Oyer and Terminer, which is English. It had no grounding in Scots law whatsoever, but it's the, the law you used to hang, draw and quarter Wallace. And that was put on the statute books in 1708, which is an absolute and utter breach of the treaty the year before. I didn't realise that. I thought that they, you know, he recognised Scotland as an independent country and the the King of England never, and they were just going to try him on those laws. But Well, the, the, the English were all, I mean, this, this has been going on since Roman times. I mean, the Romans came up, uh, the Northumbrians came up, um, and everybody gets flung back, and the English came and came and came and came and kept coming uh, and always lost. They could never take us over uh, until it was done by, you know, a few handfuls of gold and a stroke of the pen kind of thing, but it, it wasn't a battle. But, oh, no, S Scotland was an independent nation. The problem was that, you know, slightly later, Bruce gets excommunicated, which put us in a dodgy dodgy position. But we, we were actually a country before England was. I mean, I read somewhere about that, that uh, was it John Balliol was the man who signed over Scotland to become yeah, part of Britain. Yeah, but what, he, he, could, but, he didn't have but, the right to do that. But was he forced to do that? Oh, of course he was. You know, because, I mean, that's all Edward I was about, uh, you know, about conquest uh, and, and the lies that they told coming up with the, the story of Brutus, the founder of Britain, that used to have the old, the whole island and then it split asunder. Just bloody lies. Who, who's know? Brutus? Who's, who's he? Brutus, the Trojan warrior, who invented a history. And then we invented a history. Or we didn't invent a history. We gave them a bit of ours. Um, because one, one of the great things about the Declaration of Armed Growth, is that it refers to a story that was around at the time, um, which is about the origin of the Scots. Now, at this point, they're thinking that they come via Ireland, because that's what they've been told by the church. But before getting to Ireland, the Scottish people had been in Iberia, uh, in the north of Spain, roughly the Basque country. And before that, they'd been in Scythia, which is over by the Black Sea. And before that... Scota, the eponymous founder of the Scots, was the daughter of the pharaoh. So what you're actually talking about is a story here that's talking about people coming into Scotland from Iberia, which is exactly what happened after the last Ice Age 15,000 years ago. That's where the people came from. Uh, genetics have proved that these same people had come from the eastern Mediterranean, probably somewhere around about Scythia, what was known as Scythia then. And before that, the Evercoast had come out from Africa. So you've actually got us giving a story which could only have come through oral sources about us having originated in Africa and coming around that, which is exactly what we know. This is what happened. It makes we now know sense that. that because, you know, coming out of an ice age, people would have been probably concentrated around or closer to the equator. You would yeah, have oh yeah, very much so. And they, they call them refugia. Uh, each one is a refugium, and the main one for Western Europe is roughly the Basque country, um, around about the Pyrenees, and the other one that populates Russia and Scandinavia is actually in the Black Sea, which is part of the area which is generally referred to as Scythia anyway. So what we've got is stuff going into our story, our version of who we are, which has since been proved by science. Brute, Brutus is a, a Trojan warrior, Going back to that, he would have been Greek, right? Or yeah, that area. From literature. From literature, okay. Where did that come from, though? Where it comes from Homer, Greek. Okay. You know, the, the, you know, the, 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 the Iliad, the description, uh, which pe people are pretty sure that uh, that originated in oral stories. They'd be and then he, he just pulls it all together. Um, and, and it becomes this 
very structured um, literary thing. But you've also got to remember that the the monks who are writing the history uh, and who are helping the kings become uh, leaders of centralised nations, these people are educated in the Bible and in Roman and Greek sources. So this is what knowledge is to them. We have a different knowledge ourselves, which is the knowledge of the people which survives within the communities and within the culture of the people in those communities. And it's amazing how much you find of, you know, oral transmission actually has value in historical terms. Never ever fall for the, the, the old line, you know, it must be true, it's in a book. Um, because, you know, particularly historians are not to be trusted. And I usually say to my students, me in particular, um, though what I say is that the best I think I can do as a writer and as a teacher is to give people information to let them make up their own minds. Because yeah. in the final analysis, you've got to make up your own mind because everybody that's telling you about the past, whether they admit it or not, has got biases, prejudices and points of view. Like, I am, you know, I'm an independista and that colours everything I do. Not and I'm never that. going to deny it. No, not just that. When I read it then, I'm going to paint my own picture as well. Yes. You know, which That's may even do. be different to the way the author has painted it. Absolutely. You know, and um, how they've described a situation. Mm -hmm. uh, this is why I like about podcasts because um, you can just go back and delve into something and yeah. say, okay, well, let's build more of a picture on yeah. that. And um, Also, the other thing that's good about them, and this is something I initially uh, discovered, basically going out into the landscape, looking at stuff in the landscape. The more of you are involved, the more can, you can find out. And people come up with absolutely mad ideas or what they think are completely mad ideas. And you can check them and find out they actually make sense. And the more people are involved, the more that happens. Because it's like if there's two sets of eyes on something, they see more than twice as much. Three sets see more than three times as much. And it's the same with discussion. You're talking about ideas. And ideas from the past, we have to understand in the present that the people who we're talking about in the past, they were just... Just like us, they weren't any dumb, they weren't any stupid. No, you know, they had purpose, they were doing things on purpose, absolutely. Yeah, um, I'm gonna start to wrap up, Stuart, yeah. but I want to ask you for the listeners because I know a lot of people listen from outside of Scotland. Um, what would where would you recommend what would be a good place for people to come and visit or a few places? I mean, a lot of people come here to Edinburgh yeah. to visit, and it's it's got an amazing history, a beautiful place, but off the beaten track. If they want to find out about the real, very ancient history of Scotland, places that they could go, where would be an exciting place to, to well, go? Well, you see, the, the, that's that's one of the things. That, because I, I spend I, I spend so much time uh, researching and finding places. And, oh, God, I've not been there yet. Um, or I've not been there. But the the most spectacular uh, of them, obviously Kilmartin, uh, what they now call Kilmartin Glen, uh, over in Argyll, that is... That is absolutely stunning. Uh, also, the, the glens coming off the, the valley of, of the River Ad there. Um, all of that area is just absolutely brilliant. Um, the island of Jura. I know. only know Jura for the, for the whiskey. Yeah. Well, I, I, <laughs> but tell me, yeah, so no, the island of Jura's Jura, got great history. Jura, Jura is, full of, is full of great stories, but it's also got, at the north end, uh, the third biggest whirlpool in the world. Uh, the Corrie Vrecken Whirlpool, yeah, I've heard which of, of course is very, very strongly associated with the kayak, the goddess. The the rock under the sea that forms the whirlpools is actually known as a kayak. Um, so Jura, certainly a wonderful place. Kilmartin over in the west uh, is brilliant. Clava Cairns, uh, south of Culloden itself, they're fantastic. And if you can get as far north as or Orkney, I mean, Brodgar, the whole... Complex. I haven't spoken to you. I'd love to go and see yeah. that. Oh, it's it's absolutely fabulous. And the people in Orkney are, of course, absolutely lovely. Um, the problem, of course, is that you know nowadays most of these places there's too many people in them. But there's there's lots of places like you mentioned Saint Vigians. That's really worth going to because you've not just got this gigantic mound in the church. You've got a museum of Pictish symbol stones. Yeah. Meagle, the museum of Pictish symbol stones. There, they're mainly class two. But again, the Catterthins, well, I love the Catterthins, you know. Um, but I, I should give a, a pitch for St. Martin's Stone because that's where I came across the story of the Nine Maidens because that's supposedly raised 
on the site where they killed the dragon, the eight, the nine sisters. And that, I started digging into that in 1974 and I've not stopped yet. Great. Um, Stuart, where can people find you? Where can they find your information? The- well, the books, most of them, well, whatever's in print will be on Amazon or Lewith, L-U-A-T-H, Lewith. They're published most of my stuff, not all of it, most of it. Uh, there's www.stuartmcharney.wordpress.com, but that really needs to be updated. I'm so busy with other stuff, I, I don't, you know. And scattered about on you, there's me doing music, me doing talks about the Jacobites and various other things. Are you, on, are you on any social media other than YouTube? I am on Facebook, but not so as you'd notice. Okay. I try and avoid it, but I'm thinking of getting back out. And I do have a plan to go on TikTok okay. now that it's getting thrown out of America. My last question, which I ask, like to ask everybody, if you were me mm-hmm. and you were doing the podcast and you could speak to anybody from history, you have to do a podcast with someone from history, who would you like to talk to? Oh, there's so many. But actually, seriously, I think it would be Sergeant Moore that I talked about earlier. Yeah, I think it would be him. He certainly sounds like an interesting character. He was. And it's stories. time somebody wrote, you know, actually wrote the book about him. I, I've just got too much on, you know, scheduled at the moment. Well, maybe you get the chance. It's good to, it, it would be great that somebody preserves that history before it's forgotten. Yeah. Well, Stuart, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> it's been a fascinating discussion. I've really enjoyed um, having you on the podcast. Uh, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Well, uh, and hopefully we'll get you on again yeah. uh, when when the books come out. Yeah. If that's I'd, possible. Yes, I'd be more than happy. Cheers, Michael. Thank you.